Right. So you're, you're in Santa Monica. I'm in Venice, yes. So oh, you're in Venice. Welcome, welcome everyone. This is Jody Evans. I'm the co-founder of Code Pink. And this is another in our webinars to help you know, U.S. citizens understand what their government has done to Iran and how we've led up to this moment that was almost World War III a week ago. And I'm really excited because I have Taghi Amrani as our guest today, and he is the director of Coup 53, a documentary that he made over 10 years about the coup in Iran in 1953, a coup that the United States government CIA named Operation Ajax. Um, Ajax like the cleanser, to cleanse out a democratically elected leader of Iran. Um, Peggy, could you start by telling us where you are right now? Right, well, you happen to be talking to me uh, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, uh, some might argue that the, the devil of the belly, the belly of the devil, or the belly of the devil. Um, I'm here uh, at very short notice because one of the funders of the firm uh, is hosting a hub, a startup hub, and I happen to be one of the uh, projects she supported. And she said, you should come and show your film here. So I got on a plane uh, at short notice and I find myself in a school hall, in a secondary school who kindly offered to host the screening for the uh, uh, Davos delegates. How many will show up as anyone's guest? There, there are thousands of parties happening here every night, every hour. Uh, so th this is a challenge for the film, the choices between champagne and caviar and a documentary about the 1953 coup. <laughs> but a very a pivotal moment, that 1953 coup, um, because when you think about like even the balance of powers, Iran is kind of between these two powers that um, were forming in 1953, and um, maybe start by telling us why do, you know why do you think the United States wanted to overthrow a democratically elected leader of Iran? Okay, so some context here is critical. Um, Harry Truman, President Truman said, there is nothing new in the world except the history you do not know. This is the history that a lot of people don't know. And there are a lot of uh, myths and false information. There's been, because in the, in, in the absence of real evidence and documentary evidence and papers, uh, you try to try and piece things together. Uh, one of the misconceptions about this coup is that it was just an American coup. It was just a CIA coup. It wasn't. It was actually masterminded and triggered and created and planned by the British. This was very much a British operation where the Americans joined in later. But it has for the last 66, 66 years been known as the CIA coup. Our film turns that story inside out. Our, our film has got new explosive evidence, documents and interviews and material that really tells the story of this uh, coup in a new way, in a very revelatory way that puts the whole thing into context. It gives you an idea of who was responsible, how it happened, why it happened. Uh, of course, oil was at the heart of the story. When is oil never at the heart of the story when it comes to the Middle East? You know, we were joking the other day that if Iran and Iraq only exported turnips, uh, we wouldn't be there. And this is not my line. This is the line from the great uh, journalist Robert Fisk that I heard him say in one, uh, one of the uh, meetings I attended. Uh, so it's, it was always about Iran's oil and the control of Iran's oil. Iran's oil was uh, controlled by the British. The Anglo-Iranian oil company practically owned Iran's oil, oil for, for over 50 years. And uh, what became the turning point was the election of Prime Minister Mossadegh in 1951, purely on the ticket of nationalizing Iranian oil and ending that control, which triggered the, uh, the, the anger and the, uh, the, 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 the resentment of Churchill who believed Iranian oil was British oil, and, uh, and he managed to lure in Eisenhower and the, and the CIA to help his MI6 uh, officers to overthrow Mossadegh and reinstall the Shah and, re and, and put in a place a military general as the prime minister. And our film tells that story in incredible detail, the most unbelievable documentary detail that we managed to put together over 10 years. Well, um, so it really was covert ops, though, that um, yes. overthrew, um, that created the coup, and we're, we're, you know, witnessing some of those same covert ops that took place in Bolivia, that was an effective clue, 
coup, also of a of a leader of the people that cared more about the people than about the profits of oil. But um, nationalizing oil, uh, that would have been having a democracy and nationalizing oil would have been very important to Iran. Um, can you also talk about something else that happened then, um, which was, I believe, uh, they used also sanctions during those two years. Um, is, is that true? Okay, so uh, there are a lot of things that have to fall into place for orchestrating a coup. Uh, and a lot of what we see today, we were, we were blown away by the parallels of the events today uh, with the story that we are telling from 1953 putting sanctions and trying to strangulate a, a, a country's uh, economy to bring it to its uh, heels what was done in 1953 by the British. But uh, particularly they, uh, they told everybody in the world, anyone who buys Iranian oil buys a lawsuit because to them, in fact, that was stolen oil. There were people who were buying Iranian oil were buying stolen British oil. So that was one thing that uh, is happening now. Um, fake news. Uh, was invented back in 1953. Uh, they, they, the CIA paid huge amounts of cash buying up newspaper editors and columnists and journalists in Iran to uh, put out propaganda against the prime minister, uh, calling him a homosexual or, or a communist or a fanatic, a uh, crazy guy, and anything that would cut destabilize his government. And in fact, uh, they, 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 Stephen Kinzer, the brilliant author of uh, All the Shah's Men and a great journalist who is features uh, in our film, uh, said the CIA couldn't get enough material uh, to, 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 to get to the journalists. So they had somebody in Langley writing fake news and having it shipped to Tehran to be translated. Uh, assassinating key allies, uh, an army general who was very, very uh, uh, devoted to Mossadegh and was his like, line of defense against, uh, against the, uh, uh, the, the coup plotters. He was assassinated. Um, slow down and say that again. Sorry? Slow down and say that again. They assassinated a general, right? Uh, uh, Mossad uh, uh, appointed the chief of police, a general at, at that time, a, ge a general who was a chief of police and was very loyal to him. And he was fighting against the coup plotters. He had secret information about uh, the army officers who were plotting a coup with the, with the CIA and MI6 agents. And they kidnapped him, strangled him, uh, tor tortured him, tortured him and assassinated him and threw his body in the mountains north of Tehran. This was a way of destabilizing his government and taking out one of his allies in order to prepare the way for, for, for the overthrow. Um, so, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, information that has come to light during the making of the film. Because it took so long to make the film, we, we kind of had time to dig deeper. We went further than any other documentary, researching footage, documents, books, papers, personal and public. Uh, to put the story together. And uh, how many people know that the Shah's secret service was in fact founded and trained by the CIA? Uh, as soon as they put him back in power in 1953, they realized that they needed to prop him up. This, this guy has been, you know, put him back in power. He needs, he needs support to stay in power. So they sent, in fact, we have an interview with the man who did it, the, 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 uh, the military intelligence officer whose job was to train the Shah's uh, secret service uh, is interviewed in our film. Uh, long dead, but we have the footage. And he talks about how you know, the, the, he helped shape this, the Savak Secret Service. I grew up under Savak when I was a kid uh, 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 pre-revolution uh, in Iran. So I, I kind of know that experience firsthand. My teachers were arrested frequently by, by, by the agents. So growing up in Iran under the Shah, you know, what, were the what were the politics like? How did people feel about the coup then? And um, how did that feed in again to the destabilizing revolution and where we are now? Well, you can't understand the revolution and its aftermath and where we are with the mess we're in inside and outside Iran. You can't really understand that until you know the backstory. You know, uh, uh, victors never forget, uh, victims never forget the victors move on. Uh, the, the, the scar, that, that kind of the resentment that was planted amongst the Iranian people just kept bubbling away under the surface until it exploded in 79. You can draw a direct line from, 17, uh, from 53 to 79. Uh, in fact, you know, uh, uh, one of the first portraits that was held up in placards uh, on the streets in, in the lead up to the revolution and after uh, were portraits of Mossadegh. He, he still embodied 
uh, and symbolize for Iranians a secular democracy, which is something they haven't had and are still struggling for. So um, when you say it led up to um, the revolution and now, um, so it caused the revolution, but what, um, it, was it the revolution that people wanted? Um, yeah, it, was a, it was a major factor. It was definitely a major factor. And uh, it, it, it was uh, the, 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 the fact that it was very much uh, an anti-American, uh, you know, the death to America uh, uh, was invented in 79, but it wasn't heard on the streets of Tehran uh, for the first time in 79. It was also heard back in 53, uh, when, they, when, the, when the first attempt of the coup failed and the word got out that they, they were involved. But I have to keep stressing that this is not an American coup only. Uh, that, that if there's the one thing that our uh, film puts the record straight on is this was an Anglo-American coup. This was as much, if not more so, an MI6 coup with, which brought in the Americans. Uh, the, uh, Churchill reached out to Truman uh, first when Truman was still in office saying, help us out. Let's, let, he, he would never say, help us get our oil back. He said, help us save Iran from communism. We need to save Iran from communism. They, they made a bogeyman out of Russia. Uh, uh, and so the, the fear of communism was, the, was, was, the, uh, was the, the, sort of the pretext for this. And Truman quite rightly said, no, uh, we, uh, we are not in the business of overthrowing governments. Iran has, 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 has a sovereignty, has to be respected. And in fact, he was even offering aid to Iran to kind of uh, solve its economic problems. But as soon as uh, Eisenhower got in, uh, even before he took office, even before he was inaugurated, uh, uh, the, the MI6 and CIA agents under the under control and uh, direction of Alan Dulles and his brother, uh, John Foster Dulles, started planning the coup. Um, so, but MI6 could not have done this on, his, on their own because the, uh, um, uh, Mossad realized and this, you know, was found out what, the, what was happening and he kicked the British out. He shut down the British embassy and expelled everybody in the embassy, including the secret agents who were handing out the money and organizing the coup. Uh, and so in that situation, where they had no assets on the ground, they had nobody in Tehran anymore, they had to reach out to the Americans to help them out. So that's, that's how the operation became a joint Anglo-American operation. Well, can you remind our audience who the Dulles brothers were under Eisenhower? Uh, John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles uh, were two of the most powerful corporate lawyers in America. Uh, they worked for this legendary firm, Sullivan and Crumble, uh, which was more than just a law firm. Uh, it, it was the kind of the, the, the legal face, the kind of international face of uh, American corporations abroad. They could go and change entire face of nations with the power they wielded. Uh, very murky history of uh, uh, Alan Dulles in the Second World War and his and his, his, his operations with OSS in Switzerland and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, when Eisenhower became president, uh, he elected John Foster Dulles as a Secretary of State and Alan Dulles as head of the CIA. So these are pretty powerful brothers. And they got to work. They got to work even before uh, taking office. And one of the big first projects was overthrowing Mossad Dep. And so um, they're buying the media, they've, they've crushed them with sanctions, they've got covert ops. So they bought some, uh, and, and you say that the, um, they, they bought uh, some religious leader came into this. They, they found someone that they could pay, that could create a mob yeah. in the you tell, tell a little bit about that. So they, they had several uh, uh, tools in their toolbox for this, for this coup. Uh, one was uh, uh, retired army officers so who, were, who were on the payroll and were, were ready and willing. And, and retired army officers who were loyal to the Shah and were, were, were keen to help. Uh, uh, that's one group. There were journalists and uh, columnists and uh, newspaper editors who were easily bought and very willing to write propaganda to help the destabilization. Members of parliament were also bribed. Uh, to you know, put, put spanners in the work, a wrench in the works of, of the sort of parliamentary process. Uh, uh, one or two religious leaders were involved because they had a mass following uh, amongst the ordinary people in the bazaar. There was a renter mob, you know, the heavy guys, the guys would get things done. You pay them, they get stuff done for you. Uh, uh, so, and there are some very, very prominent business leaders who also had connections with both to the mob and the religious leaders. So it was, a, it was a very good toxic mix that came together uh, at the right time to pull off the coup. Incidentally, you have to know that the first attempt at the coup failed 
uh, because the word got out and Mossadegh and his um, loyal officers uh, who were guarding his house were ready for these people to show up and, um, and it arrested them. And, and, and then the word got out and there was a mass protest in support of Mossadegh. But, you know, uh, in fact, it was uh, under the direction of the MI6 uh, agent, Norman Darbyshire, who was controlling and directing everything from Cyprus. Uh, he was the head of Iran station from Cyprus to wireless and radio, you know, walkie talkies. Uh, got the mob out to enforce, to kind of have a, have a second go. And that ended being the coup on the 19th of August. And of course, the Shah, the young Shah, was a critical character in all this because without his signature, without the, ro without the royal decree, uh, they couldn't go ahead. So he also kind of funded it or supported it and um, made it happen. <laughs> Well, he gave, uh, he wasn't so much funding it, he, he, gave, he gave his signature. Uh, he ha symbolically, this had to look like it was a royal decree, an order from the Shah under the constitution that could dismiss a, a prime minister and install another one. Uh, and uh, so they had to get that signature from him to basically fire Mossadegh and reappoint someone else. Okay, and then um, some, for some reason, lost Have your- you Oh, there we are. You're back. Um, and so one of the things I found interesting in your film was at the end of the film, uh, someone says, oh, how, how amazing. These covert ops are awesome. We can use these to take over other governments. Do I, do I remember that correctly? <laughs> well, uh, the, the, the Operation Ajax, the, C the coup in Iran in 53 was a CIA kind of first covert action, you know, covert overthrow of a government. And as far as they were concerned, it went really well. It was quick, it was cheap, it was easy. No Americans died. Uh, so it was like, wow, we can do this again. This, this emboldened them. Uh, and so uh, they obviously went and pulled that off again in Guatemala uh, ex the next year in 1954. Uh, and, and I thought, you know, we have a whole string of coups, you know, all the way to 1973 and Chile. And, you know, how, how long have you got for the list? Uh, this, this sense of uh, confidence was falsely created because the British suppressed the role. Uh, the MI6 man who was the mastermind and really was the critical fact guy in pulling this off wasn't allowed to speak. They, 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 he, they, it didn't exist. He didn't exist. The operation didn't exist. And the British were not involved, which gave free reign uh, for Kermit Roosevelt, who was the CIA's man in Tehran, to come back and, and overinflate uh, his, his sense of achievement and the ease with which this was pulled off and, and pumped everybody up. Uh, he, he wrote books, he was on talk shows, he got a lot of deals, he got a lot of consultancies, he got a lot of uh, good juicy relationships out of this, this, this uh, role he had. In the absence of the British acknowledgement and uh, admit, you know, admitting their part, so had, had it been a different scenario, he wouldn't have been able to uh, encourage the, British, uh, the American government to go ahead and pull other things off in, in Latin America, starting with you know, Guatemala. So that lie emboldened the US to continue. We've, we've lost your video again. Oh, good. Um, yeah. So, um, you know, because of that, for quite a long time, it was really seen as the U.S. coup because the U.S. took credit for it and they, the CIA was front and center, which is a lot of why you see death um, for America in 53 and then again in 79. But um, talk to me about how Iranians feel about the United States right now, the people of Iran. Um, yeah, America not only uh, kind of claim credit for it, some documents have been released uh, gradually over the years in in, in 2013, uh, more pi papers came out that essentially was CIA admits its part uh, on the 60th anniversary of the coup. Uh, and uh, nobody has ever really apologized for it, but uh, Obama has talked about it, has, he's acknowledged it uh, in his big Cairo speech when he became president. He's, you know, he's reaching out to the Muslim world. Uh, Madeleine Albright has talked about it. Clinton has talked about it. I think Americans have acknowledged that it happened and they were involved. The British have not, to this day they have not. So the bogeyman has been, uh, and quite rightly so, because without them it wouldn't have happened. And after the coup, America became the dominant power in Iran. They took over and pushed the British aside. They became the dominant power. So a lot of death to America is death to America because of that. Um, I think if you remove governments, 
people to people are incredibly good at connecting. There's so, so many cultural, social parallels uh, between, uh, there's so much capacity for friendship and cooperation between American people and Iranian people. You remove governments and you're in a different world. I mean, that's, that doesn't just apply to Iran and US. Any uh, people, you know, people are the same. I, I'm, I'm saying things, I'm, I'm now you know, repeating a cliche. People care about the same things. They, they come together over the same things. They connect over the same things. They have a lot more in common that separates them and differentiates between them. And, and you know, I have so many American friends who go to Iran uh, on tourism trips and they come away blown away by, by the hospitality and kindness and the connections they make. Um, yeah, so th there, is, there is no animosity between Iranian people and American people. That's not where the problem is. That's never been the problem. Uh, the problem lies, you know, where we know where it lies. So um, that's, that's, yeah. So thank you so much for talking to us. I mean, we're doing this because we really want to educate people about Iran and what a beautiful country it is and how much it's been put through by the United States government for so long, including devastatingly right now with these sanctions that were already crippling and now have been even created more extreme sanctions. Um, for you, what, it, you know, in the last months, how has it felt to be, feel this close to World War III, um, the United States against Iran? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm torn to pieces as an Iranian to see what, you know, the ordinary Iranians are going through uh, and, and the way this, this relationship, this poisonous relationship has lasted for so long. We are now in our 40, 41st year. Uh, of the standoff, but the important thing is for people to know context and know backstory. Uh, if only we knew why we are where we are, we would see things differently. We would understand things. Uh, the sanctions only hurt ordinary Iranians. They 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 hurt my relatives and my friends and you know families. Uh, they can't get the medicines. You know, uh, it doesn't really help the situation by penalizing and punishing the people. Uh, I, I I don't understand this. In, in, there's no luck to this for me. Uh, you know, we were talking to the Iranians. We were, they, were, they were having negotiations. They, they signed a deal. There was, there was you know, uh, people came around the table and talked for the first time uh, with the JCP. How do you say it? The JCP, I always forget, you know, the, deal, the nuclear deal that uh, Trump tore up. Um, you know, <laughs> the, right. So um, it, it's a, whilst I'm torn to pieces about what's happening, uh, right now, uh, as an Iranian, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I have to say, I'm happy that it's brought attention to the film. The film has become incredibly urgent and vital viewing and really timely. Uh, we began making it 10 years ago. Never did we think in a million years, a film that we started 10 years ago, which was essentially about history, uh, uh, has become so relevant and timely and vital viewing. Uh, it developed into a, a thriller or an investigation. We didn't see it become that. You've lost the picture. Yeah. Have you, yeah, I'll come back. Uh, a lot of reviews. We've had incredible reviews. We've been blown away by the reviews. And after our Telluride world premiere, uh, uh, people are referring to the film as, as a thriller. Uh, then incredible novelist John Le Carre came to it, came to see the film. Someone has described the film as like worthy of a John Le Carre novel. There are, there are. I have the world's greatest film editor working on this. I think that's that's where I owe all the credit to the, the brilliance of the film is Walter Murch, the man who worked on Apocalypse Now and and, and The Godfather and The Conversation and The English Patient. He worked on this film for, with me for four years, and uh, we had the ride of our lives as filmmakers, bringing all these uh, disparate pieces together in a very compelling story, which is not just a history lesson; it's a thriller. And it's an enlightening piece of history that people should know because it's now current affairs and not history. And it is kind of a mafia story, uh, just the mafia members being the British and US governments. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in fact, some of the guys who were in the pay of the British look like kind of the, uh, straight out of The Godfather or Al Capone. They wear the same hats, they wear the same suits. They must have been watching too many movies, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's got, uh, this movie has got history, a thriller, an assassination, there's even some sex, but not on the screen. Uh, it, it's got uh, battle scenes, it's got animation, it's got everything you want and more. And it will leave you blown away and enlightened and really educated. So well, what can I say? Thank you for giving a glimpse into the film and into that very potent time that has really been the leverage to where we are today. 
Um, sorry you have to be in the belly of the beast. And um, we're calling on everyone to be with us this Saturday as we have a global march for peace and to end war with Iran. Um, right. And people can find out more about that at code pink backslash 0125-2020. And do please add the teaser to the film so people will know what we're talking about. Of course. Thank you so much, Huggy. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.